And we're going to begin our second panel now, balancing the demands for water with the need to grow and raise food. And as a reminder, we are still streaming online. We encourage you to follow along on Twitter if you're following us online. And you can join the conversation by going to uh, using the hashtag FoodD. That's FoodD. And then we'll also be taking questions again for our panelists uh, from Twitter and the in-person audience here. Members can use the note cards that you were given when you first came in to ask you questions. We have three new panelists returning from the first panel and uh, three new panelists for this panel. The new panelists are Jason Rogers. He's uh, Vice President of Operations for Titan Farms. He oversees management of the farms, which includes 5,000 acres in Rich Spring and Saluda County, peaches, bell peppers, and broccoli. Glad to have you along with us. Also, Bill Stangler, he is the Congaree River Keeper. Uh, he is a graduate of the University of South Carolina. Bill has led the uh, Congaree uh, River Keeper Group for the last four years. It's a Columbia-based nonprofit that works to protect local rivers. Thank you very much. Thank you. And Lisa jones Taransky. And Lisa, from 2010 to 2014, served as the director of the Conservation League's Food and Agriculture Program. She led the effort to launch Grow Food South Carolina, South Carolina's first local food hub. And uh, Lisa, let me begin with you. Tell us a little bit about uh, some of the things that you've been involved with with the Coastal Conservation League. Well, um, I, I'll try to stick to food and agriculture sure. when I talk about what I've been involved with because the Coastal Conservation League works in many different program areas. I also want to tell you that I don't always sound like this. I have a chest cold today. So just in case you're wondering if I start coughing. Um, so the Coastal Conservation League works in energy and climate, transportation, land use, air, water, public health, and food and agriculture. In my time at the League, I've worked on land use issues, and I've worked on food and agriculture issues. The reason that that's relevant is because the, we started the food and agriculture program as a result of the land use work we were doing. We were seeing farms being turned over to developments. And we wondered what the problem was, why farmers were having to sell their land and why we were losing this really important economic engine that is a vital part of our history and our economy today. Um, and, and what we found is oftentimes it was lack of support in terms of infrastructure. There was not really a distribution network for the small to medium sized farm. And so we wanted to be an advocate for those farmers that weren't currently tied into a system that worked for them economically. So we started Grow Food Carolina, which is a, it's called a local food hub, but it's essentially an aggregation center in downtown Charleston. Um, we aggregate from local farmers within 150 miles and distribute within 30 miles, although both of those numbers are flexible. And, uh, and we use it as an opportunity to talk to the farmers. We started with five farmers. We now have more than 70 farmers working with Grow Food Carolina about other issues that they are encountering, <coughs> whether it is regulatory issues with selling their products, food safety issues, and of course water is one of those issues. So we really use that community of farmers to learn more and hear the voice of small agriculture here in South Carolina. Okay, Jason, tell us more about Titan Farms and what you do with Titan. <laughs> okay, um, Titan has been around since 1999. Um, it's a family owned operation, a single owner. Um, it started at 1,500 acres and today is at 5,000. Uh, grow peaches, bell pepper, and broccoli. <coughs> and my job there is to oversee all the cultural practices, whether it be irrigation, um, crop protectants, anything we do to grow those crops. So basically, from the time it's transplanted till we harvest, um, that's under my jurisdiction. So, um, very progressive company, use a lot of technology, and I hope we get to talk about some of that here today. Good. We certainly want to hear from that. Um, tell us a little bit about um, how you use water and where you get your water from. Um, well, on our farm, we're 99.9 percent .9 surface water. So we have ponds on the farm that obviously when you get a rain, it's captured, and then we're able to use that water. And then we use uh, electric pump systems to distribute that water. Um, very sophisticated systems, and uh, to talk a little bit about what she said with smaller farms, 
versus you know some of the larger farms and how they use it. What I've seen over my 20 years is that a pump system to do an acre of land used to cost about $200 an acre. Today it's about $900 an acre. And so when you look at those costs, that's kind of what's bumping the smaller guy out. And you know, that's a disjustice, but that's the financial world that we live in. Um, but our systems are very complicated. You know, we only use the water that we need, you know, very seasonal. And so for a crop that's 12 weeks in duration, it only gets water pumped on it for those 12 weeks. And so it's very strategic. Um, the old adage of more is better is not true, as we can see in the rain events that we've had in the last six weeks. Um, my ability to feed my plants has been halted because I have too much water on the land. And so that's always a constant struggle of a little bit of water, too much water. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a, it's a huge dynamic that as a manager, I have to decipher every single day when I wake up, you know, how do I care for my crop today? You know, am I protecting it from the heat or am I protecting it from too much rainfall? Mm -hmm. And so that's a, a constant battle that um, I chose to get into when I chose to be a farmer. So. <laughs> you knew what you were getting into. I knew what I was getting into, and I don't regret it at all. Um, it, it's an honor for me to grow the food and fiber for our country. Um, one fun fact that I had when I was preparing for this is in 1960, which was just before the big technology burst in this country, one U.S. farmer could feed 25 people. Well, today, one U.S. farmer feeds 129. And so that is a great stride, knowing that technology helped play that part. And so did larger farms, because the population in ag in 1960 was about 8.5%. And today, it's less than 2%. And so there's a lot fewer people keeping our bellies happy mm. at the end of the day. And so it's a privilege for me to be one of those guys. Okay. What is a river keeper? Yeah, so Congaree River Keeper is a grassroots nonprofit that works to protect the three rivers here in the Midlands, the Broad Saluda and Congaree. Uh, and we do a whole lot of different stuff, everything from taking water quality samples to organizing cleanups, doing outreach and education, to holding polluters accountable. Um, we work uh, alongside DHEC in a lot of ways, and, and uh, occasionally we, uh, we bump heads, but a lot of time we're, we're trying to do the same job. Um, we speak for the rivers, and we work to protect them um, from a number of different things. All right. Um, David Bays, let's go back over just sort of the, set, the, the ground, uh, the Surface Water Act. Just give us a, the highlights of that one more time. Okay. So um, there uh, is now a relatively new piece of legislation and regulation mm -hmm. where large surface water withdrawals uh, required either a permit or a registration. Uh, that triggers three million gallons in any month, which is about 100,000 gallons per day. And um, they have to uh, report their water use to us so we know how much they used and they're in compliance with their permits. And more importantly, we can then take that data and uh, put out reports uh, indicating how much each water sector, like if you're a public water supplier or an agriculture user or an industry, uh, uses every year. Bill, what do you think about that act? Is it doing enough to... There are a number of concerns with uh, the law as it stands right now. Um, we heard about some of these earlier in the day. Uh, safe yield, is safe yield actually safe? Um, you know, the number, uh, the, the percent of water that's allowed to be allocated um, for different uses is based on an average. Um, and so when you look at that across the year, you can say that um, you can allocate more water than is available in a river at a certain time. Um, fish don't live on averages, so that's a serious concern. We also have concerns about um, public notice um, for withdrawals. Uh, agri agricultural uh, registrations don't have to go through a public notice process, so people might not know what's going in next door to them. Um, there are also concerns about yeah, the, uh, the lifetime uh, of, the, of the registrations. Uh, we talked about that a little bit earlier. Um, so there are a number of, of different concerns with the law as it stands right now, and, and really specifically with the ag exemption. David, is there a public notice requirement for uh, no, there's not, and um, let, me, let me say up front, I'm not going to try and defend the law one way or the other. It, it is what it is. There was a very robust stakeholder process that took many years to develop the law. Uh, not everybody got what they wanted, um, and uh, that's the nature of a compromise. So it is what it is, and so we implement the law um, as it exists. And so I'm happy to talk about uh, what the law does and does not contain, but I'm not going to try to editorialize one way or the other. 
but the answer to your question is no, it's not, because registrations uh, are not a permit. And so if somebody is applying for a permit, it actually has a very robust public notice process mm -hmm. um, that goes along with it. But a registration uh, is essentially just that. It's, it's letting us know uh, that that withdrawal is occurring. And really the only uh, burden that the uh, agriculture applicant has is to tell us what is, is um, they expect to withdraw and we make sure it's within that safe yield number and then from that point on, they're essentially um, approved. It's notice along the lines that, yes, they have triggered the act, and, and so they need to let you know, or is it they need to let you know how long they're going to be withdrawing that much Well, it, it is an application for the registration, so they let us know that they would like to take out X amount of water at a particular point in a, uh, in a river system. And uh, again, we do that analysis, the very same analysis that we would do for a permitted user to determine the um, safe yield numbers and to, to crunch all that. And it, but the law then says if they're within that number, they're essentially deemed approved. And that's why there's, there's no notice or anything that goes with it because that's just a registration that's automatically approved. Jason, how does that law affect you? Um, well, our ponds are registered with DHEC, um, the ones that we withdraw from. And We've been doing it actually before it was required. I probably, I probably have data from the last 15 years of every gallon of water that's been pumped out of my ponds. We did that as a proactive approach to say, you know, if there ever was a regulation, that this is what I know I need. This is my farm. It's been here for 70 years. This is what we need. We know we need this in the month of July, the month of August, the month of September so that we know that we can grow that crop. I mean, obviously, you know, if I could predict the future, if I know I'm not going to get a rain, I don't plant a crop, you know. That's pretty much common sense. But, you know, we live in South Carolina. We get 50 inches of rainfall a year. Very adequate rainfall, one of the highest numbers in the country. We have great river systems. We have great pond systems. We have great reservoir systems. So we've got great infrastructure for agriculture in South Carolina because we do use a lot of water but it's for the greater benefit of all. And so the regulation process or permitting process, you know, it's very cumbersome. You know, for me who is in it and has been in it for 20 years, it's not a big deal. Mm -hmm. But for the young guy getting out of college who wants to be a farmer, it's a big deal to him because he can't get into the system. And so as a farmer and as a person who believes that the ag sector is a big deal for South Carolina. I want to help that guy because he's going to feed me when I'm old. And so we need that guy. And somehow we've got to all come together and say, food is a priority. Mm -hmm. You know, we need food. We have great land here. We have great water. Why not grow it here? You know, don't ever regulate us out so that we have to go somewhere else um, because this is my home. It's been for 39 plus years. Um, and I hope it is for another hundred. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, that, that's, that, that's where I'm at with it, so. Elaborate a little bit on why the younger person can't get into the system. Well, it's the barriers of entry. Um, as they talked in the first panel, you know, there's certain rules that farmers or landowners were godfathered into. Well, now if, you, if you've got to play by the new rules, where it be, and there is a restriction on a gallonage of water and we know it takes, just say, a crop takes $10 million to, or 10 million gallons to grow, mm -hmm. but you're telling me I can only have three, then you have to cross that crop off. It's, it's not attainable, you cannot grow it. And then the dollar signs of what I talked about earlier, the irrigation acre that was once $200, that's now $900. Um, that's big money, and so you've gotta have capital, you've gotta have collateral to be able to go out, and when I go talk to a banker, you know, he really doesn't care how good a guy I am or how much integrity I have or whatever. He looks at my financial statement. And so I can't borrow $10 million if I can only yield a million-dollar corn crop, if you will. Mm -hmm. And so you've got to, all those plantings have to be dealt with prior to you planting that crop. And so there's a lot of homework that this young guy has to do to be able to, to get into the system. Had I not gotten into it 20 years ago, I would probably be an engineer or something now. I would not be a farmer because there's just so many hurdles that you have to hop over. 
Um, and that's a just justice to our whole world because the population's getting bigger every day. They're not making any more land, and we gotta feed these people because I don't care who you are, everybody I've ever met eats yeah. every single day. Um, and so we need that. Water is very important. We can live three days without water and 21 days without food. And so I, I think we see that as, as a very uh, viable industry. We've got to take care of our water, you know. And I am a conservationist. I'm a farmer. I know exactly how many gallons I need per year. I know the land that I'm farming. And I've got to take care of that resource. It's no different than my tractors or my barns or my packing shed, whatever I have. It, to me, it's a tool. It's a piece of equipment that I've got to take care of. And so we monitor those things. We use technology. We use soil moisture probes in our specialty crops. As they talked about earlier, it uses a lot of water. But now there's probes that go into the ground that sends me a text saying, OK, today you've got this much. This is the temperature. This is the evapotranspiration. This is how much that crop is going to use under those conditions. Now you give it that amount. You haven't gotten enough rain to cover and, that. And it's you're right. So if there's not a surplus, then I have to add that water. And you can't get any, you know, that technology is only going to get better. We've been using it for four years. It's saving us 40% in water use. Now, as a larger farm, does that mean I need to go out and try to find 44% land to maximize my water? No. I'm happy where I am. I do want to be that conservationist, and every bit of water I don't use is going right down the stream, and somebody else doesn't, somebody else is going to get to use it. And so it is a renewable resource. Every bit of it goes to the ocean. It comes back around this rainfall. And so and we're blessed with that 50 inches a year in South Carolina. So it's a very sustainable, renewable resource for us. Can the sensor system be replicated on any size farm? Absolutely. Um, there it's is not cost prohibitive for there, a small Well, area. it is cost prohibitive. And how we've gotten around that is we know our soil types in our area. And so I'll put in a representative number of soil probes, and I gleam that information. So instead of putting one on every single tract of land that I have, which would cost me millions of dollars, literally, because the system I have right now, 10 probes cost me $60,000. And so it's not cheap technology, but considering the cost of water and its value to my operation, that is a worthwhile investment. And so for me to be able to use it on similar soil types, obviously I have similar climate because I'm farming in a small region of the state. Then I gleam that information and I use one tool to farm the other land. And it's worked out beautifully. And Lisa, what do you think about the legal structure we have set up to protect our water? The Surface Water Act in particular. Um, I think it's imperfect as many of our laws are. It's, it's not perfect because we don't know how to make it perfect right now. Um, we don't know enough information. We also, and I, I will just say along the lines of what you said, David. David. Jason. Jason, Jason. darn it, sorry. Um, that uh, we, farmers and conservationists have the same interest in this game. We don't want the water to run out as conservationists. Farmers don't want the water to run out either. And the way that our law is structured right now, we could have a big farm come into the state and locate on a small river and jeopardize current production, the water resources for current production. Um, that's a problem for farmers, and that's what that's our concern. It's it's a concern about keeping the industry alive, which goes back to Grow Food Carolina and why we do what we do, which is we have got to protect these resources. I mean, water and dirt, right? They're key for farming. You can't do it without it. So we need to figure out sustainable land use practices along waterways and prevent erosion and all of that as well as protect our water resources so that people can keep farming. Of course, we also like to use these waterways for recreation. Um, one point we haven't talked about is that there, all water is not really the same in terms of its impact on the ecosystems or the source when you withdraw it. There are some bodies of water that can withstand major withdrawals because they're large bodies of water. Um, you know, they're ponds. And then there are our very 
unique Blackwater River systems. And, and we, I don't know that they should all be treated the same way in terms of regulation. I also think that right now we have a law, one of the problems is that if we were to enforce every part of the Surface Water Withdrawal Act right now, I think DHEC is not equipped, staff-wise, um, to do the types of monitoring and response and all of that to implement contingency plans to make sure every day water isn't dipping beneath the minimum in-stream flow. I mean, right now it's not much of an issue, right? Because of the rain. But um, in times of a drought, uh, I worry that we don't have the capacity there. But do we need it there? Or do we need to focus on technology, which is another big piece of what we need to be investing in and looking at? We should be able, as citizens, to understand what our rivers look like every day in, in terms of their water levels. It should be a transparent process we should know how much a farmer is withdrawing and where the water levels are. I mean, we have some USGS gauges out there, so we have an idea in some areas. But we have Fitbits for people where we can look and tell how many steps we took every day and versus our calorie intake. Surely we can set something up for rivers where there is a way to determine as a citizen whether a level on a river is healthy or not. None of that speaks to groundwater. And groundwater is something that is not in, obviously not in the Surface Water Withdrawal Act, but is also a resource that in a way is more dangerous that we can't see it. At least with the river, we can see the low water level and we can say that's a problem. But what are we doing surface water wise? And all of these studies that are coming out will be very helpful. But I, I just don't think it's a perfect law, but I think we're all struggling farmers and conservationists to determine what does need to happen to ensure we have water into the future. David, uh, does DHEC have enough people to carry out the law fully? Well, I, yes, I think we do. We've got, um, again, we have this um, dynamic that none of the existing permittees are subject to this minimum in-stream flow requirement yet because those are subject to the new permits and not the existing ones. So uh, the typically what we do uh, as well is ask the permittee to provide that information. So there can be systems set up where they have their own monitoring gauges and then report that to us. So I, I don't think it's a, a question of our, um, our resources. Uh, it, it's just, you know, some sort of real-time uh, system for river gauging and river management is something that's um, you know being talked about uh, in lots of places and would obviously be uh, something very exciting in the future to look at. We have a question from the audience. Aside from on-site ponds, do farmers, large or small, have plans for alternative supply during periods of drought or low flow? Charles Weaver. Yes, we do. Um, you know, I have a farm where I, I use groundwater and I have surface water on the same farm, and when it's when it's wet or when I'm not having to irrigate very much, I'll, I'll pump into my reservoir and then that gives me extra water to use. And this on farm pond is strictly a reservoir, it's not on a stream or, or creek or anything. And that gets me through the periods of time where I don't, where I might have to pump a lot of water so I don't pump as much out of my groundwater. But yeah, we, so in some cases we do. Now I don't know that that's, that's not a widely adapted thought right now. What about you, Jason? Well, our farm, we don't have any major rivers or any type of river that runs through it so that we could, that's not an option for us. And so we solely rely on the, the capture of water in our ponds. But what we've done, um, obviously, when you put your brain to something, it, every, every problem is a puzzle that we have to figure out. And, and what we've done, our ponds are, we're located within our 10 or 15 mile radius, the whole farm is, so it's relatively tight. Um, but what we've done is we've run irrigation lines from one pond to the next. And so I may capture a big rain over here and fill this pond completely up and this one's going down. So I'll pump water out of that pond into this one to fill it back up. And so I'm using the water that I capture um, to accommodate my whole farm. You know, obviously that's a huge infrastructure cost to put in those pump systems, to put in the pipe in the ground, to be able to do that, to use the water that I'm capturing on my land. But that, that's our way to, to refill, if you will, 
Um, wells are not really an option in our area. You can punch a well 400 feet and get five gallons a minute, which won't sustain a house, much less to fill up a pond or, or to run an irrigation system. And so we have to rely on our ponds solely for that job. Okay, and Lonnie, what about you? Um, kind of like what we talked about in the first panel, we have employed measures where we have terraces on our field and we direct the water to waterways and direct them into our ponds. If we're periods of extreme drought and the creek that's feeding the pond, you know, lessens and the pond dries, it is possible that we can irrigate to the point that the pond doesn't have enough water to keep going. As far as technology and some of the things that Jason talked about, you know, having infrastructure between ponds to be able to transfer water, that's not something that we have. And you're talking 5,000 acre farm versus 200 acre farm, and it gets into things being cost prohibitive to be able to do stuff like that. Okay, next question from the audience. As our population and communities continue to grow, stormwater becomes a growing concern. How are agriculture and municipalities communicating to better control stormwater impact on flooding? David? Yeah, we, we do have a, a separate stormwater laws uh, that, that are not part of the Surface Water Act. And um, municipalities, uh, the larger ones are designated, uh, MS4 areas they're called, and, and they help uh, regulate the stormwater within their, their control. Uh, I, I think this is another uh, area for you know, for future development, the whole idea of um, water reuse in a more robust way. Uh, it, it is a, a bit of an irony that in a state that gets 50 inches of rain, that sometimes we just don't have enough water uh, to go around. We can't experience severe drought. And um, so it's, it's not that necessarily we don't, we just don't necessarily have all the water in the right place at the right time is more of the problem. And so some of these technologies that are evolving with more advanced treatment of wastewater, uh, so you can have reuse of wastewater, uh, so that you can have reuse of stormwater, uh, I think are, are all, again, very exciting uh, technological developments. Uh, but they, you know, they have to reach sort of a practical stage for implementation as well. Uh, but um, all that is certainly being looked at. Okay. Lonnie, stormwater. As far as our management of stormwater goes back to, you know, how we try to capture and divert stuff to our ponds. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm not, from our standpoint, I'm not sure what better way we can do as far as managing stormwater. Um, you know, when it comes down 20 inches in three days, it just kind of goes where it will. <laughs> Jason? Um, I'd say the same thing. I mean, obviously, um, around our fields, there's ditches that capture water that runs off, and then that goes into our ponds. You know, that's, that's how we feed those, you know. Um, an acre inch of water is 27,000 gallons, and so every time we get a rain, it's captured on that land. Some goes in the ground, the excess runs into the ponds, and so um, we really don't have any hazardous things on the farm that there's a threat of that stormwater inhibiting something downstream. Um, so that's really not a water, worry for us because we've got a great filter in the soil, in the grasses, and that type of stuff to, to help filter out anything that could be bad um, coming from that water. And Charles? We, you know, we just want to get it on top of some grass uh, and get it in a grassed waterway, make it take the long way down the hill. Don't, don't send it straight down the hill. Send it on a much easier slope or, or grade and, you know, just get it on top of grass and, and let, the, let Mother Nature do her work from there. Bill, should agriculture be treated differently when it comes to water usage as opposed to other users? Well, that's a, that's a really good question, and it gets to a point I think we've heard a lot today. We hear a lot of people talking about... Um, food, and, and that is a really important, you know, farms do grow a lot of food, but the ag exemption in the surface water law doesn't just apply to food. Um, agriculture is defined as a number of different things. Uh, you've got forestry, you've got um, growing sod, you've got agricultural production facilities that all get that same exemption. Um, so <coughs> I think we might have to look at that a little differently because when you're talking about um, certain farms that may use the same amount of water as a, as a large city in South Carolina, um, or as a, a coal-fired power plant or a nuclear reactor, then you probably have to put them on the same regulatory playing field as those large water users because the impact to the rivers and the impact downstream is the same. You mentioned uh, earlier when you were talking about the Stormwater Act or the um, Surface, water? Surface Water Act that uh, you thought that uh, a stronger, something stronger should be used than the, the notice requirements that, that they have now. 
Yeah, well, um, with ag registrations, there is no notice. So certainly I think um, there could be some strengthening there. Uh, I also think um, when you get to enforcing that law, um, when you can cause, when it, uh, withdrawal can cause damage, um, there's a weakness there as well. Uh, right now, and David, correct me if I'm wrong on this, uh, if an ag withdrawal, um, for them to reduce the withdrawal amount or suspend the, the registration, they would have to go over the allotted limit and cause damage. So if a withdrawal drained a river and caused serious ecological damage, as long as they didn't go over that number, um, they'd still be allowed to withdraw as much water as they wanted. Uh, and so that's, a, that's, in my mind, a serious flaw. If you know that there's a problem, um, that there's serious damage happening, um, the law is not written in a way where they can go in. The agency has the, the authority to go in and stop it. Yeah, that's how the law is written. Okay. Another question from the audience. As our population and communities continue to grow, uh, well, that, that was the one we just did. In light of the recent flooding in South Carolina and the large number of broken dams, is DHEC going to regulate all dams to the same standard as animal waste lagoons since no lagoons ruptured during the floods? Well, those are um, really two different universes. Uh, the um, animal feeding operations or agricultural permitting is under one program and set of criteria. Uh, the, the, uh, the dams that were breached that have gotten the recent attention, of course, were not agricultural facilities. They were earthen dams, often in, in neighborhoods. So it's a different universe, different standards uh, looked at uh, in, in, under different regulatory schemes. I think they're, they're wondering if there should be a stricter standard for dams in South Carolina in light of the recent flood. Well, I, I think it's certainly going to be a topic of discussion, obviously. Uh, it, it is a policy question, um, and no doubt uh, that discussion is going to, um, to happen. Okay. To Charles, how much surface water does agriculture use statewide? David, I believe the number is about 3% of the total water use, total surface water use of the state. I believe agriculture uses about 3%. 3% statewide and of surface water. surface water. Of the surface water. It's about 10% overall. If I can jump in on that, yeah. th that's true, and we do look at a lot of different things in that. You've got yeah, municipal water, industrial water. What we do see when you, when you kind of get down into it is you can find certain basins in South Carolina, and, and um, what pops to mind is the Edisto and the Selkahatchee, where agricultural water use is significantly higher there. Um, so there are, there are more um, stressed basins by agricultural water use than others. Um, so when you look at things at different scales, you can kind of get uh, different, different views on that. So when you really get down, you look at, at the Edisto and the Salkahatchee, that ag number goes up a whole lot. And those, those are the basins that are really being stressed by water withdrawals right now. So what do you do? I mean, do you <laughs> separate the, the way you regulate that? From well, I, it, it raises a number of questions. That's right. Is it a one-size-fits-all um, bond? Or do we need to look at, at different regions? Um, some states have looked at different uh, minimum flow requirements based on eco region, or is it river specific, or is it even site specific? Um, and that's those are some questions that, that we have to look at um, for the long term health of this law and, and our rivers. Charles, what do you think about that? Well, you know, I, somebody mentioned earlier that the law is not perfect, and I don't know that there is a perfect law on the books, but the law is a compromise that took years to get passed. As David mentioned, it was a lot of meetings between all the stakeholders. I don't know if anybody came away with everything they wanted, but I think everybody came away with a pretty good deal in, in, the, in, the, in the sense that it was a good compromise. I think it's a fair law. I think it's a huge benefit. It's a bigger benefit to small farmers than to larger farmers so that they don't have to navigate through that permit process. They have the registration process. And I'm not aware of an ag exemption in it. I, and I'm aware of an ag registration, but not that. I don't know that agriculture is exempt. Um, from the law if they eclipse the three million gallons a month threshold. I, I think it's a good law. I think it's certainly a step in the right direction. I think statewide it brought 97 percent of the surface water use in this state under a permitting process. And if you go 97 and 3, you could be in the Hall of Fame in any sport. So, you know, it's, I think it's a good law. Is it absolutely the best and if you, if you dissect it and drill down and look at any one part, no, there's a little problem here, there's a little problem here, and there's a little problem here, but I think, it's, I think you'll find that with just about any law. Jason, what do you think about that, tweaking the law and making it? Um, well, our it state is very diverse. When you look at the agriculture areas in South Carolina, most of them are around river basins because that's the most fertile soil. 
you don't go to the mountains in our state and row crop. It's, it's not possible. And so those areas over time have been designated for ag areas. You know, are we to change those now? I don't think so. Um, but those are the most fertile areas. And so as we look at, you know, the timber regions of South Carolina, the ag regions of South Carolina, obviously our beaches, our rivers that dump into the ocean down in the low country, those are all different dynamics. And so when you go into treating everything differently, you're just, you're opening up for 15 different new laws, you know, that aren't gonna be perfect, that aren't gonna be right, that are gonna go under some type of scrutiny. And so I don't know how we protect what we have today um, in a common sense approach. You know, obviously, I don't know any farmer who wants to drain a river, you know, because that's his livelihood if he farms beside a river. I definitely don't wanna drain any of my ponds because that's my livelihood. These, these ponds hold water because there's springs underneath the ground that help fill them up. If you dry that cavity, it'll never fill back up. And so you, you're protecting your investment when you're doing that. And you know, all the farmers I know are in it. You don't become a farmer because of business. You know, business people invest in cars and technology and these things. Farmers are born into it. I mean, this is your livelihood. This is what you do. And so you have to protect your environment because that's your, that's your asset. And so there is a common sense approach. You know, obviously more people need to come to the table when we try to make a law or, or talk about these things, which we did um, in this um, 2010 bill. I mean, there was a lot of heartache over that thing. And a lot of people, a lot of stakeholders, you know, spoke their piece to try to figure out how we all live together, you know. And obviously, you know, we wouldn't be having this conversation if it was 1900, when 90% of the population farmed because we didn't have time to do anything else. We had to work so that we could feed ourselves. Well, now the farmer has took that on his shoulders and said, hey, I'll feed you world. Now you can go do other things. Now we can have lawyers, we can have state institutes, we can have all these other disciplines that make our world better because they're producing some of these technologies because they have the luxury of doing that because they know they have a safe food source that I provide. And so why is the game constantly getting harder for me to give you food? You know, so that's the burden that goes back on the farmer at the end of the day that's gonna keep the next generation from saying, oh, I don't think so. I think I'm gonna do something else. Dad, you had a good thing going? but I'm moving on. I'm going to go move to the city and I hope somebody feeds me. So that's a scary set of dice we're playing with right there. Very scary. Lisa, what do you think about that? Well, I think that um, no one wants to add a lot of regulatory burdens to farmers. Um, and I also think that the point that you've made about the majority of our food production being in a very few farmers hands is a good one it also shows that our system of food production has changed a little bit we've we've gone into a more um, efficient industrial model of food production which puts different stresses on our resources than we had 50 100 years ago um, and I think we're in in the middle of figuring out what that means especially on the waterfront um, but also, like I mentioned, soils and, and other critical aspects of what we need for our food production. Um, so, but all of that being said, I don't think that the way that the Surface Water Withdrawal Act is written today puts those types of burdens on farmers. First of all, there's the three million gallons per month threshold, and I don't know many small scale farmers who are starting a lot more than that for their withdrawals. So they wouldn't have to do anything to comply with the law. Um, and then beyond that, the way the law is written, you just have to register your withdrawal. So, and, and the only way you wouldn't get that registration is if you were pulling in total with all of the other users on the river more than 80% of the average mean annual, or the mean annual average daily flow, which you probably shouldn't be doing. I mean, just from the farmer's perspective too for the other farmers pulling from that river is probably not good for anyone, definitely not good for the ecology and the other uses of the river. 
but also not good for the other farmers using that river. So I don't think that there are burdens being placed on farmers right now that make it more difficult than before the Surface Water Withdrawal Act. And, and I also don't know that adhering to the permitting process, it's not that different than a registration. It just is the public notice and then it's a contingency plan, which when you, when you work with people like Walther Farms that started the whole conversation really brought it to light, they're, they're great guys and they want to have a contingency plan because it's smart business. Um, you know, if water runs out, they don't want to have to be stranded. They, they, the contingency plan is just to have an alternative source of water in the event that the river levels go down. Um, so I, I think that the law as it is and some of the options that have been discussed wouldn't end agriculture in South Carolina. I don't think it's that dramatic. I also don't know that it would protect the rivers forever the way it's written. There are a lot of unknowns. Um, and, and again, we're, we haven't even gotten to the other water uses. You aren't even pulling from a river. And, and what are the implications for sustainability with those resources? I also wanted to address something you said earlier about the cost of irrigation. Correct me if I'm wrong, that's the energy associated with pulling water and irrigating. No, Is that's, that the cost? that's just the system itself. The system, so the technology Hardware. to upgrade your system. That would just be the pipes and the pump. And pipes and pumps. The, dis the distribution of water. So I think there's also something to be said for having resources for farmers to upgrade their systems, not only because the cost has gone up, but because we could get more efficient. I mean, state of the art, it sounds like, and I know I toured Walther Farms and their system is incredible um, in terms of reading the moisture content and not using more water than is needed. Uh, I think there's an opportunity there to help um, defray some of those costs. David, can I add something here? Um, I understand what you're talking about. I, I, I'm going to sum it up for you. You kind of talk about the industrialization of our food supply. Yeah. And I agree with you completely. But these regulatory programs, if, if farmers had to get into a permitting process, it just pushes it more and more that way because it's more difficult for small farmers to, to navigate that permit process. And 3 million gallons a month is only 70 gallons a minute for a month. That's a two and a half inch pipe. That's a small, that is a really small amount of water. I want to, I want to add something here. I told David I was going to do this earlier. There's a gentleman from New Hampshire and Massachusetts. I don't know how he came from two places at one time, but he was a U.S. Senator for 19 years and a representative for 10 years and Secretary of State uh, several times. But in 1957, he was designated as one of the greatest top five U.S. Senators ever. It's Daniel Webster. And John C. Calhoun, ironically, is in that list of the top five U.S. Senators ever. But he made this statement sometime prior to 1850, because that's when he died. Let us never forget that the cultivation of the earth is the most important labor of man. When tillage begins, other arts follow, what you were talking about. The farmers, therefore, are the founders of civilization. Daniel Webster was a bright man by all accounts, an incredible attorney and uh, had a lot of foresight. I think Daniel Webster knew in the value of agriculture when he made that statement. I think Daniel Webster recognized the value of a society's ability to feed itself. I think Daniel Webster would agree that if a country can feed itself, it's got a lot of problems. If a country cannot feed itself, it has but one. And the most important, the most startling thing here is over 65% of this country in 1850 on the U.S. Census consider themselves farmers. Today, that's well under 2%. So if it was that important in 1850, what's that, 175, 65 years ago? If it's that important then to recognize, to make this statement, how true must it be today to help protect a country's ability to feed itself? Now, we care about the resource immensely and all of our natural resources, but we have, to, we have to use that resource in a responsible manner to feed this country because I don't want to buy my food from somebody 
on the other side of the world I can't talk to you. You know, I want a deal that allows Americans to be Americans. Okay, thank you. Lonnie, um, if there were a permitting process rather than a registration process for the surface water, how would that affect you? Well, and I'm not as familiar, so David, you may have to help me with what all is involved in the permitting process. I know one of the things that you mentioned was you had to have a contingency plan. And from what Charles and Jason both have said, it, the current act helps the smaller farmers more than the bigger farmers. You've got a small farmer, 100 acres, let's just say, and in order to irrigate, draw surface water, if he's got to go through this permit process, he has to give public notice, which means the public, no, public has time to, or the ability to protest, and we've seen with livestock operations who've tried to go through permitting process how cumbersome that can be and how long it can take to push that through. If you talk into having to get a contingency plan, is that small farmer on his own qualified to come up with that plan or does he have to hire somebody to help write this? And then you get into expense. And when you're, you know, you're looking calls per acre and calls per production for this small farm, it could be very, it could be make or break for him being able to do that. And you mentioned, you know, three million gallons a month, and so there's a lot of small farmers that don't apply, and they would never be part of that permitting or even registration process. But 25 acres of corn is going to take more than three million gallons of water per month to grow. I would say 25 acres of corn is definitely a small farm. Five acres of strawberries is more than three million gallons a month. So I don't think people realize how much water it takes, and you think. Three million gallons is a really huge number, but it's not when it comes to watering crops. And so you're looking at small farmers who would have to go through this permitting process, who would be delayed for even being able to irrigate their crops based on the timeline it would take to go through all of this, and then the expense and whatever steps are involved with writing contingency plans and getting those approved. It really could be a life or death situation for that farmer to be able to continue to farm. Jason, how would a permitting process affect you? Well, just to chime in on some of what she said, um, if, if you were to tell me today, on December 31, you got to start the process to get a permit um, to pump water. And no matter what the acres is, if five acres, 10 acres, 1,000, whatever. I'm planting my crop in March. And so can I get that permit from January 1 to March 1? You know, that's two two months, two real months, you know, is the process that fast? I don't think so. And so if you just delayed that farmer a whole year's production because he's, he's literally got to set that land out because he can't illegally pump water if he knows he's got to have a permit because then he could get fined or obviously go under more public scrutiny because he broke the law. Um, so, you know, where does it start and stop? So, you know, you... You don't want to cripple one's livelihood by saying you got to do this. You know, obviously we got a big problem here, but you've got to figure out a way to ease into this problem. You know, it isn't always a law or a permit. I mean, it's common sense. I mean, you got to have good faith that this guy has kept his records and he knows how much he needs. He's not fluffing those numbers. I mean, why would I tell you I need 100 million gallons when I only need 50? You know, that's not how you do business. That's not a man of integrity, um, which I think where this whole thing should start anyway is, you know, the common sense approach of a businessman doing business. You know, a man's word is the highest value. You know, we've gone away from that in this country, and now it's like we're dealing with a bunch of crooks. And that's not who farmers are. We're very reputable people. You know, we take care of our land, we take care of our people. When my farm fails, so does my 500 employees and their babies, along with my baby. You know, I got a little problem if I can't feed my family, but if my farm goes away, my whole community goes away. And so then there's church organizations. There's all the things that go with inside small town America that are dependent upon farms because that's what we do. That's who we are. We're not Wall Street. In New York City, you know this is Ridge Spring, South Carolina. Titan Farms is a viable entity with the largest employer in that county, mm -hmm. and so farming means something to that community. It may not mean something to people in big cities, but it definitely means something to us. 
And so we have to protect that at all costs. I'd like to add, too, one thing to that. Um, Jason is talking about the time if you are told December 31st you have to have a permit, you're going to start planting in March. You have a two-month window. If you can't get it done, like you said, farming, you've just lost an entire year. The difference between agriculture and industry, who is currently required to permit, if that plant gets held up, whenever his stuff comes in, he can start. You can't, you know, you got to plant corn in March. If it's June, you can't just plant corn in June. You've lost it. It's, it's very seasonal. It's very time sensitive. It's, it's two different things because we're talking two different things. Agriculture is different than anything else. Bill? Yeah, we're talking about some hypotheticals here that I'm, I'm a little confused by, which is nobody's <coughs> talking about forcing existing farmers to go get a permit. Um, you've heard David say it a couple times now. Existing farms are grandfathered in. Even any proposed legislation I've seen grandfathers in existing users. Um, so talking about, oh, someone's going to make me on, on January 1 go get a permit, that's not a scenario that's out there. Um, and even then, if you were going to start a new farm and you knew you had to get a permit, um, you wouldn't start planning before you had it. If you're going to buy a house, you don't start moving in before you get the loan. So I, I think we're getting a little off here when we're talking about someone's going to force you to get a permit now. You're an existing farmer. You've been grandfathered in. Your, your farm ponds are exempted. We're talking about new farms, really, in, in any situation when we're talking about this kind of stuff. So I think that's where the focus should be on. And that's where it really comes down to protecting the existing water users and existing farmers from someone else coming in and taking that resource that we all depend on uh, in an unsustainable way. And that's where I think uh, improving this law can really have a positive impact on existing farmers. But, but Bill, are, are you talking about new farms? Or are you talking about new withdrawals, new withdrawals. on the existing farms that want to expand? If you're, if you're take now, the, and, and again, this gets to the law, uh, if you're going to have a new withdrawal, um, then that, and then I think it should go through a permit process if you reach that threshold. And that's, yeah, and, and as a farmer, the stories we hear about the appeals process, when somebody can appeal a permit, when, and I've never been through this myself, but I've heard plenty of stories a farmer can satisfy all the regulatory requirements and then somebody maybe two counties away come in and appeal it and then it gets held up for six months a year or whatever and those are some nightmarish situations when we're ready to expand you know we've got everything ready to go and then we get we got to just sit and wait because somebody 60 miles away has a complaint and that's I mean that, that is a that's a nightmare to me Af and, and I'm talking about after we have met all the regulatory requirements. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, uh, yeah, and that's, uh, that sounds like a, a real concern with the legal process. Um, I don't think that should prevent us from passing laws that are common sense um, that help protect our resources, is that someone might, in some scenario, be able to abuse that system. Um, that shouldn't prevent us from doing something that's for the greater good overall. Yeah, I've, I've heard some, some terrible stories about a lot of different permitting scenarios, too. Um, but for the most part, we want to make sure that goes well. And if we see those things, uh, we can work with agencies and, and legislators to fix those problems. I think that's, that's where we really all need to come together and say, you know, yeah, th if we find these problems, let's go and fix them. And that's where I think we're at with this law right now is we passed a law, and we have the responsibility as a community to make sure we can continue to improve it. If we stopped every law after we did one try, um, you know, we wouldn't be passing any new laws and, and we'd kind of be stuck, um, you know, with laws from hundreds of years ago. Yeah, but I'm not sure the law's broken. I mean, I, the law's worked one or two, just a handful of times. You know, I'm not sure the law was broken. I, it worked like it was intended to work and, and whether one big farm comes in, the Walters, what, they put 3,000 acres down there. So if that, whether one 3,000 acre farm comes in or 30, 100 acre farmers come in, you still got the withdrawals. Or, or whatever the numbers may be, you know. So I think I, I don't know that the law is broken, and you know I want to find a reasonable solution to a serious problem, and I'll work with anybody to do that. But I don't want to make up a problem or perceive a problem to try to change the law because I I don't know that the law is broken. I don't know of a situation where it did not work. Well, the 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 problem just at the most basic level is that under the current law, you can allocate more water than could be available in a river. I mean, that's, it's just math. So that's the flaw. And, and while we haven't seen the worst case scenario happen yet, it certainly could. Uh, you know, if we hear from the South Carolina Department of Commerce that they're going to recruit an uh, almond farm from India that's very water intensive, 
Um, and our law is still to the way that they can allocate more water than is available. And we've got people that really want a lot of water. This could create a scenario. So I think uh, the impetus uh, is on us right now to fix it so that we don't have to try and scramble to do it when it is a serious, serious problem staring us in the face. David, are there protections against drawing in the law against drawing down like that, like he's talking about? It, it, it again would depend on the, um, whether you have a permit or a registration in the sector that you're in. Um, if you are a new industrial user, uh, then you would be subject to those conditions like a contingency plan and the minimum in stream flows, which would indicate when you would need to stop withdrawing from uh, a river system. If you're one of the agricultural registrants, those conditions do not apply. Okay, here's a question from the audience. Should we as a state have a goal of growing more of the food that we eat? Jason? Personally or as an industry in South Carolina? As an industry. I mean, I think everybody should both grow some of the food they eat. That way they can realize what goes into it. Um, South Carolina is a very blessed region. We have lots of natural resources here that allow us to grow all types of things. Um, you know, there's so many different types of farms here in South Carolina. I mean, personally, I don't think people, I mean, if you have a job and you work 40, 50 hours a week, you're probably not going to grow the food you eat. When you go home, you're going to watch TV. Um, so they're relying on going to the grocery store and buying that food. Um, and in doing that, somebody obviously had to grow that food. So that's done in certain regions in the United States. Um, when we look at it at a bigger picture, um, food can't be grown everywhere. You don't grow food, you don't grow bell peppers in a desert. It's impossible. Um, there's certain regions of the country, you know, and when we talk about protecting, I mean, I think we should protect farmland. You know, if we want to have a residential division, move it to the desert. You can put artificial turf down to see something green, <laughs> but you can't establish good cropland in the desert. So there's a a fine blend here of common sense and the world is becoming more populated, more people are going to eat, more food is required, less land is going to be available because that person is going to want a house too. Doggone it, they want to eat and have a house. <laughs> you know, I mean, so there's a lot of things going on here. This problem is, <laughs> we're, we're down here on the iceberg. This thing is going to get big before it's over. Um, you know the world is basically going to implode on itself because we're not going to have enough food for everybody to eat. Um, so we've got to figure it out. But yeah, I, I would challenge everybody to plant a garden next year. That would be a great little science project for every family <laughs> is to have their own garden and realize the water that goes into growing a crop and growing a successful crop because that's the difference in you planting a pepper plant in your backyard and watering it once a week and you might get a pot of pepper off of it and me growing one every day and getting eight pods of pepper off of it so that each and every one of us up here can have a pot of pepper. Totally different scenario. This next question is for you, and I'm not sure I can read this. Tell, tell, tell us about the use of drones. Drones. Um, well, that's a new technology. We have not employed it yet <coughs> at Titan, other than doing some commercials and that kind of stuff. But I can see that as the future of scouting. You know, for the general public, it's probably not going to mean anything. For my efficiencies as a farm manager, it's going to mean big things because it'll be able to tell me which deficiencies I have in fertilizers or, or drought situations in the field, those type things. So it can, I can better manage my resources using that technology. And so, but it's still a ways away. You know, a lot of people are scared of them. No insurance company will insure them now because of liability. You know, there's a lot of things going on. It may never be cost effective. Um, there's a lot of research being done with them now. It's exciting um, to think that we can look from the sky and, you know, determine the health of our crop or our livestock or whatever we may be growing. It's, it's pretty exciting. Okay, the next question is from the audience. If a farm can uh, reduce their water needs by 40%, that is more efficient irrigation. Should uh, we continue to have the same allocation for the farm? Shouldn't that extra water be freed up for others' use? Charles? Well, it, it could be freed up and it, it could be used to expand that farm in acreage and not a new withdrawal. Um, so anytime that we can 
capture efficiencies anywhere on our farm, we're going to capture them. Jason, y'all talked about drones. We're looking into to drones right now, and it's very exciting how you can put an infrared camera under the drone and go find your places in the field where your crop's under stress, and that's where you know to go look, so you don't have to walk the whole field. And um, I'm going to get back to a question you asked about should we be growing more food? Absolutely, we should be growing as much as we can here locally. The average piece of produce that you pick up in the grocery store, the average piece now, has 1,500 miles under it. And that, that number needs to come down. That's quite a carbon footprint. Mm -hmm. And we're not going to get that to zero or 10 because we're never going to grow citrus here and bananas and avocados and things like that. But we should get that number down. And we should certainly try to get it down to, to uh, three digits. Um, and, and the world, the, the, everybody knows that the world's population is really exploding. And it's going to take technology. Some that Jason mentioned, maybe GMOs. I don't want to get into that. With, uh, you know, in this debate, but it's going to take technologies like that to feed this world and to do so efficiently and economically. Can I, can I add to that? Sure. Um, obviously, as one of the participants in launching Grow Food Carolina, I think that growing food and eating locally is very important, not only for the carbon footprint, but for the local economy and just for the quality of life here in the state. Um, I, and I also just want to make the point that there's also a behavioral change that would really help um, in order Absolutely. to further yes. our, our food supply. I, uh, a third of what we grow isn't what we eat. A third of it is going to feed animals. Um, and then I think it's a sixth that goes to biofuels. So it's, when you look at what we're growing, about half of it, maybe a little bit over a half, is what we're actually eating. Um, so, and, and then there are also behavioral changes in planting a garden, um, making your children aware of where food comes from. There's an education component. There's the technology component that I talked about earlier. There is no silver bullet when it comes to agriculture. There's not with water withdrawal. There's not with making sure that our food system is sustainable, but what we do know is that there are positive incremental changes that we can take, whether it's policy or behavior or technology. And so that way it's a little less overwhelming to me because every little bit of participating in those changes helps. All right, we're going to wrap up in just a minute or two, so if you have a last question that you're dying to get in, go ahead and write it down and we'll get it picked up for you. Um, and also, if you're watching uh, on the internet, uh, you can go to hashtag food D, hashtag food D, and uh, send in your question by Twitter. So let's uh, <coughs> take the la last couple of questions. What does sustainability mean to you or your operation? I, that's a really tricky definition. I've heard a lot of people, in fact, I heard Charles say a few weeks ago asking the question, what does sustainability mean? And I think it means different, pe different things to different people. For my farm and my family, sustainability means preserving our land and our natural resources so my children and my grandchildren and future generations can stay on the farm and do, if they so choose, do the same things that we are been doing. Sustainability also means bottom line financials, because if I don't have the money to operate next year, then I can't be sustainable. I think it's a two-fold definition for us. Jason, what does it mean to you? Um, along those same lines, I mean, sustainability is monetary, because obviously, to, to put it in a nutshell, sustainability to me is, means I get to get up tomorrow and do it again. You know, that's the simplest way I can put it. You know, whether it be having the resources to farm, whether that be money, fertilizer, water, land, employees. You know, there's a lot of things that go into growing our food and fiber. And so to be sustainable, it has to be a complete system. You know, you've got to have a good plan. You've got to be able to execute that plan. And so you've got to have all those resources available to be able to do that. Because as in any system, you're only as strong as the weakest link. If the chain breaks, the cart goes down the hill. And so being sustainable is, is turnkey, it's, it's full circle. We've got to be able to keep it going you know, today, tomorrow, and a million years from now. So we have to keep going. Charles? 
Well, sustainability, I think, is the ability of a business or an organization to survive and to continue. And I think that probably you could interchange the word sustainability and profitability very well because we have to make a profit to stay in business and to survive. But I'm not saying that we should be able to abuse the environment and make a profit because if we do, and I don't put grass strips, I don't put waterways, I don't, I don't put strip tillage in, I don't employ the conservation measures that I do on my farm in 10, 12 years, 15 years, maybe my land's gonna be gone. So that's not sustainable. I think sustainability employs a lot of conservation techniques, um, whether it's beneficial habitat, plantings that we do. We, we got a whole laundry list of things. We have a PowerPoint of sustainability practices that we employ on our farm. But it's, it's all about staying in business. And many times now, probably 90, 95%, of what we do or what we say we're doing for sustainability, those things fall to the bottom line, whether it's governing our trucks to a little bit lower fuel mileage to pick up better fuel mileage, putting wind skirts under our trailers, recycling BTUs or waste oil. Um, you know, the list is long, occupancy sensors, computerized HVAC co controls. All that stuff falls to the bottom line, but it's also sustainable too. So. You know, I, I just think it's, I, really I think sustainability is good common sense business practices. Going forward, how important are these discussions uh, uh, to continue? I'll, Go I'll, ahead, I'll, Bonnie. I think it's going to be an ongoing discussion, whether it's about water usage or any other issue that affects all of us, because we all have a stake in this. And so, you know, Changes occur, technology is advanced, the conversation that we're having today is not the same conversation we would have had 10 years ago. It's not the same conversation we're going to have five years from now because we just have to adapt. And so it's going to take everybody coming to the table and continuing to discuss and work together and just move with the times. Bill? Yeah, I, I think these conversations are absolutely important. Um, this, is, this is how we can get positive change and positive, uh, move in a positive direction. Uh, you know, we're not going to accomplish anything if we're just going to call each other names and argue and fight and dig our heels in. So having a, a honest, thoughtful conversation like I think we're having right now is, is really positive. Okay. Yeah, Dave. I, I, I might mention, I, I think the foundation of that discussion is good science and good data. Um, I, I mentioned this morning about the modeling project for all of our surface water basins being modeled. Um, you can go to scwatermodels.com. Uh, and following that modeling project will be a water planning process where these discussions can take place. Uh, there'll be, you know, stakeholder groups formed around the state in these basins so that there can be basin-specific plans developed on how to manage water resources in the state. Um, but it all really begins with good data and science, so we're making good informed decisions. All righty, and we're going to wrap up now uh, and ask our panelists, each panelist, to give us a closing statement. And Bill, we'll start with you. All right. Um, well, uh, I guess in closing, I'd just like to say that uh, I think the health of South Carolina's um, rivers and waterways, the health of its farms and farmers and its communities are all tied together. Um, and, and when one of them does well, the rest of them do well. And that's really important. Uh, I think another really important thing to take away from this today is that water uh, is a common good and it belongs to each and every one of us. So we have a very important responsibility to make sure that it's allocated responsibly and fairly. David? Yeah, I, I think maybe I gave it before. I think, um, you know, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. I think any discussion about water resource issues is always good uh, and a good, we just need um, good science and good data to inform those decisions. Lon? Um, I would say a lot of our conversation today has been about the Surface Water Withdrawal Act of 2010, and I'd like to point out that while that's probably not a perfect law, as none of them are, it's a lot better than what we had before because we did not have anything before, and so that was a step in the right direction. And we need to continue to have you know, these conversations, and if, if things need to be looked at, then they'd be looked at, but we do, as um, David said, we base it on sound science. Okay. Um, I, I also agree that the surface water withdrawal act that we have now is definitely an improvement because there really wasn't uh, much of any sort of regulation around it before. Um, also, I think that moving forward in order to ensure that agriculture is successful for future generations, the sustainability component, 
Um, we need to get creative here in the state and not try to apply the same models that they've tried out west or in the Midwest. We are not the Midwest, and we certainly aren't California, but we do have this incredible environment, long growing season, good soils, water, um, and we have an opportunity to try something new, whether it's the tapping in more to the local food movement and uh, carrying further some of the recommendations and making small farms big business, or whether it's, and I'm just going to say it, hemp. Um, you know, I, I don't think that we should just ignore these opportunities in the future and that we should continue to try to grow this really important, important part of our economy and way of life. Okay. Well, I'd like to thank all y'all for the discussion today. It was very good. Um, it's great to hear and see the different sides of, of any discussion. Water is very important. I mean, I think we all know that. 75% of the earth is water. 90% of our body is water. I mean, it's a, it's a big deal. We've got to have it. And I'm um, very humbled to be a farmer in South Carolina. I know I'm blessed to be here because of the situation that we have. We have a great resource in water. It's abundant. That's a good thing. And um, if there's anything I can ever do to help y'all, please let me know. Okay, Charles? Well, I appreciate the opportunity to be here and thank you all for, for being here, the audience and, and everybody that's online watching. Um, I appreciate the open dialogue about this resource and this goal need to continue. It's, you know, it doesn't cut off here in five minutes. I realize that, um, and I think everybody here realizes, you have to slice the board very thin not to have two sides. So, um, you know, there's, however passionate we feel, there's another side to that, and I see that in, in everybody in this issue. I've, been, I've known David Bates, I don't know how long now, talking about water, and I think, he, um, yeah, I think he's recognized agriculture's passion to help protect that resource, too. Um, Bill and Lisa, it's good to see y'all. Uh, Bill, I've met you before, but Lisa, you know, it's nice to meet you, and you know, we look forward to working on this going forward. That's in the best interest of our society, because a rising tide will raise all boats. And you know, we just really want to move everybody forward here. And I go back to my previous comment, a country that can feed itself has a lot of problems. A country that can't has but one. And I don't want to get there. You know, I just want to deal where Americans can feed Americans and South Carolinians can feed South Carolinians. Thank you. Okay, how about a nice round of applause for our panelists? And on behalf of the South Carolina Farm Bureau and the U.S. Farmers and Ranchers Alliance, I hope you found this discussion thought-provoking and informative, covered a lot of ground, and all the panel discussions are going to be available online at www.fooddialogues.com. We hope you continue this conversation online by following USFRA on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you for joining us.